I'm a feminist, but when I chose my cats, I got rag dolls because they were the cutest and girls because they'd be more petite. <laughs> now, don't judge me. I would have gone to a shelter, but we had to have indoor cats, and I'd had a shelter cat before that would not stay indoors, even though it had never been outdoors, and I needed to get a breed that would stay indoors definitely and would love staying indoors because I didn't want prisoners. <laughs> and now, now I've got an outdoor terrace, and they hardly ever go out there. They are very happy indoors. So I did the right thing, and it was kinder, but I did get... They said, all oh, the ragdoll boys get really big, and I wanted a little tiny petite. Is that terrible? I'm a terrible person. If I were my own cats, I wouldn't have been chosen. I'm too big. It's, it's, it's terrible. I'm, I'm a, yeah. You're right, Deborah. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but the fictional character I most feel drawn to alike is Muriel Alsop in Muriel's Wedding. Hands down. <laughs> You're terrible, Muriel. You're terrible, Muriel. You're not wrong, Muriel. You're terrible, Muriel. I bloody love that film. I do too. And it's not, actually, I've I've got to say, like, it's not to do really with getting married. It's to do with, like, having a wedding and ABBA. Like, those are just Mm. the two things that I just... Also, having a beanbag split open and enjoying it because you don't have to clean it up. Exactly. Watch that scene, you're like, yeah! Yeah, it looks so fun, right? Doesn't it? Now, Pippa. Yes. You haven't prepared any but you're an improviser so do you just want to play with us sure (laughs) i'm a feminist but at christmas i gave my three-year-old niece a cartoon book called women who changed the world and a bright pink unicorn (laughs) balance which one she liked the most i'm a feminist but The other day when I got a massage and the lovely lady who was massaging me said, oh, have you had your tits done? I was so happy. I nearly (laughs) cried. (laughs) (laughs) True story. I'm a feminist, but sometimes I get ready for this show by listening to Eminem. (laughs) (laughs) One shot is a great... If you're going to do a show... That you know that song. Lose yourself. Yeah, in that the song. Moon. That song. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Listen, whatever you get you through the day, feminists. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but sometimes when I want something from my husband, I ask him in a baby voice. Oh. Oof. <laughs> 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 I'm a feminist, but the song that my husband and I fell in love to, like the big moment that I knew I would be with him forever, was R. Kelly's remix to Ignition. <laughs> <laughs> Just let me very briefly explain. Um, MTV was on and we were sitting and chatting and he started doing this little head dance and I looked at him and it was R. Kelly's Ignition. And I just looked at him and went, are you like R. Kelly, are you? And he went, yeah. What's he like? <laughs> and he had no idea that R. Kelly was on the television at this point. He just said, yes, because that's kind of first he is. He just said, yeah. And I just found it so funny, his willingness to agree that he was like somebody and then say, his curiosity going, who, who, who's that then? <laughs> and to not know who was on. So I laughed about half an hour and then I went, this is it, you know, this is happy. This joke's not going to be any funnier in a bigger house with more money in the bank. But now we do have a bigger house and more money in the bank and I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> This means that... This means we don't have a big house. We own a smaller flat than we rented. <laughs> but this means that our song includes the lyrics, Mama rolling this body, got every man in here wishing. Well, Uncle can run, there's <laughs> someone <laughs> drunk. It's a freaking weekend, baby, I'm about to have it some fun. What? Please bounce, 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 Right. right. <laughs> and we would do it all night. And after the show, it's the And after the party, it's the hotel lobby. Yes. Um, I feel better now because I'm not the only one who knows the lyrics. <laughs> I'm a feminist. But every time somebody says to me, you should read this amazing piece of feminist literature, 
I am sick in my mouth a little bit. Just, <laughs> just a little bit of sick, not full sick, just no. slight sick. That so I need to read something again about my existence, sort of just being oppressed all the time with lingo that I don't really get with women who are not usually the same class as me. And I've got to like identify with them, like, mm, yeah, mm, this doesn't apply now. Um, not all the time, but yeah, a little bit sick, just a little bit. A little bit sick. I'm, I'm sorry I recommended the bell jar earlier. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Live from King's Place in London, The Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with Deborah Francis White and Susan Wapoma. And special guests Pippa Evans and Poppy King talking about makeup. <laughs> this is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Um, so today we're talking about makeup, mm. and as you know, we normally do challenges, and we come back to you and we go, "Hey, I went out and I posed as a life drawing model, or I made a difficult phone call, or whatever." But tonight is makeup, and I'm not a huge, you know, I'm not someone that has to like have loads of mm. makeup on all the time or anything, but I really tend not to leave the house without anything. So even if it's just the old tinted sunscreen, and this is the crucial bit, some liquid eyeliner. Yeah. I can go to a meeting without much more than that. You know, a little bit of neutral lipstick, a bit of bronzer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's little touches, just touches of colour, tints. Tints. Hint, tints and hints. Tints and hints. Okay. I mean, I do enjoy a lovely long lash mascara, mm. sure. But my necessaries, my absolute necessaries, are your tinted moisturiser yeah. and your eyeliner. Yeah, me without too. Without that, you know. You're lost. Well, look, without that, I'll definitely bump into someone I know. <laughs> That's what I've learned about life. If I go out without that, I'll bother someone and I will feel a little like, oh, you're not seeing me at my best. So I went to yoga the other day, right. but I was feeling a bit, you know, I go to try yoga and there's lots of beautiful yoga bunnies there. Yeah. So I did a smoky eye. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd forgotten that it was a hot yoga class. So when I came out, I looked like Alice Cooper. <laughs> had been in a thoroughly convincing downward-facing dog. <laughs> and my towel was all covered I don't think in... I've ever like seen someone, shroud and, I don't think I've ever seen someone with a smoky eye. What, yoga? Well, yeah. I don't think I'll be doing that again. Do you feel similarly, Susie? I didn't for a while, actually. Like you, I'd only really... You know, I love an eyeliner. I love a bit of colour, as you can see. But, see, now I've got... I don't know if you can see from the back. I've got, like, quite pronounced sideburns. If I do that... You can see it's pulling on skin. It's, I've got hair on my... I've got a beard. And um, <laughs> straight up. And you know what? Kids are cruel because what I started doing very young is that I'd get, like, my dad's Bic razor and I'd just go, just lop it off a little bit. Yeah, I can hear that. <gasps> Don't do that to your young face. Because then what would happen is that, because I've got really curly hair, I'd get ingrown hairs, which would then result in hyperpigmentation bumps, which is dark marks, which fade over time. But, you know, it's a sort of catch 22 thing you're shaving and then it comes out and then you're just constantly shaving your beard and so now I've got little dark marks like around my jawline and around my um, sideburns that's why I've got very big hair as well and um, I tend to rely on foundation to cover that up a little bit and every time I bump into somebody without foundation I think oh they've, they can see my beard and I can see you, you are also an eyeline gal yeah I love eyeliner yeah so our challenge today because we're the kind of people that don't go out without those basics mm -hmm is to take our makeup off now. Yeah. That's me throwing up. Yep, sure. For the duration of the show. Now, I don't do... <laughs> I don't know if I've ever been on stage without makeup, so this will be interesting. Oh. So, Darren, we're wondering if you could do a before photo. Please. Then a during photo, then an after photo, Can you and then delete them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, All right, uh, ready. Get, it, get it ready. So, Darren, you can come up. You're come. welcome. Welcome into the circle. Get this one good. <laughs> right. Are you feeling quite male, Darren, in this space? <laughs> Dar Dar Darren, just give a little shrug. It's a podcast, Darren. They can't hear a shrug. <laughs> <laughs> Darren's just like, please, take a picture. All right, go. Okay. This is the best. This is how it... This, mm. is, this is... Well... Mm. Yeah? <laughs> that side? Yeah, okay, I'm gonna it's do good. A, we, let's do one of those duck face ones. Okay. They do all this oh, God, I've got too much. My cheeks are too big for that. Okay, go. <laughs> I can't do it! <laughs> I tried! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So 
now we're going to do a during. Now, Tom's got us some boots deep cleansing wipes here. That's, that's a choice. Okay, it's a choice. I wouldn't have gone deep cleansing. I wouldn't have gone Tom. deep cleansing, but he didn't know. He didn't. And I've got you a little mirror just so that you can see what you're doing if you'd like to. Okay, all right. Okay, ready? Okay. Okay. I mean, go with the lip first. Is it? Are we sure about this? I'm t- <laughs> yeah, get in, get in. You're so young and your skin tone. When know. you've got pale skin, when you've got pale skin, there's a reddening effect, especially with a deep cleansing wipe. I'm <laughs> Yeah. And I've got pale skin. I think what's going right. to be terrible um, is you're going to just look gorgeous and glamorous. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> red and uneven and people are going to go oh that's not been a good comparison for Deborah okay hello <laughs> why have I invited eyeliner's coming off oh god my that, okay oh. oh Darren's still taking photos hold on I'll do it hang again. on <laughs> yeah do it you know like in, <laughs> you know like in those adverts when they're washing their face but they sort of do this with the water yeah and they sort of <laughs> they're like get they're in like, there like, yeah they're sort of like oh and it's off hang on okay, okay I'm nearly done off. mine's off okay, okay. So I can do my after now. You look the fucking same. No. (laughs) Okay. I look so much worse. I'm off. She has gold, Jess. Thank you. And by worse, of course, as a feminist, I mean different. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Okay. We didn't name this show The Guilty Feminist for nothing. Um, Okay, so we've done our challenge. This is our challenge, and it is challenging, because you can now see everything my husband sees first thing in the morning. Well, not everything. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's another show. Uh, and now I present to you the wonderful Susie Wakoma. Hi, guys. Uh, lovely room you have here. It'd be a shame if I was to mention race. Ha 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 ha! I've done it now. Um, <laughs> Ruined it, ruined it. Ah, deal with it. Um, now, <laughs> there's a point to this. Don't feel uncomfortable. Um, well, I was thinking about makeup. Makeup you put on your skin. My skin is brown. And anyone with brown skin in this country will know the difficulty that you have finding makeup to suit you in a super drug or a boot. So basically, my history with my relationship with makeup would be uh, I'd go to Elephant Castle shopping centre after school, my girlfriend, we'd raid Superdrug, they'd be like, oh my God, does this suit me? Does this suit? No, 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 the accent. Oh my God, does this suit me? Like, do, like, how do I look with this? And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, you look good, you look good. And then I would try the makeup and I'm like, oh, that's, I might as well put talc on my face. <laughs> and so this sort of led from about the age of 14 to 19, sort of doing a reverse minstrel show, um, just turning up to different parties and functions, just looking weird. Um, but then the sort of advent of the internet, which is great, you know, you get those YouTube tutorials, which can be cringe. But for someone like me, they're amazing because you get loads of beauty tips and health tips that are uh, things that I just wouldn't have known, like how to put like mayonnaise in your hair, which <laughs> if you ever try with an afro, good luck. Um, so, but the, all those things are great. And by the age of sort of 19, I thought that my reverse minstrel days were over. I was like, yes, there are colours for my face and my skin and it's great. Then something happened in 2015, which I'm going to share with you guys. Uh, as a black actor, there's, we all have our own collection, no, treasure chest of stories, things that happen on the makeup truck to do with our skin and hair. But by 2015, I thought, no, I'm free now. I, you know, people get it. People understand. Like, come on, it's 2015. <laughs> so I was, um, I was rehearsing a show. With my lovely cast members having a great time. And the lovely a makeup artist took me to one corner. She's like, can you just come over here? Not corner, went to another room, a whole other room. I thought, I'm going to be fired. Um, but I wasn't. She sat me down. She went, basically, I've been told by the channel, and this is a major channel, I won't say which one, they were told by the channel to basically make me lighter. Because, yes, true story. They told me, yeah, they, she said that she'd had instruction because the other two actors that I had most of my scenes with, one was very pale, my lovely friend, and the other one was black but very light. And because we were doing lots of studio work, they said it just would be easier if you became lighter. 
And so that's what they did. I was sat there, day one, everyone's there, you know, sort of worried about their lines and how to do this and do that. And I was sitting there being painted back to my reverse minstrel days, about to be filmed for television. And as I was sitting there being painted, I thought, God, what what other weird things people have had to do in the name of beauty? I decided for today to research some of the weird things that people have done for beauty. And my God, they were... (laughs) Bloody loads. Okay, so I'm going to just give you four because I had to really, really knock it back. So the thing that I found really amazing. Number one, in the Roman era, women use belladonna drops to make their pupils bigger. Now, I didn't know that making your pupils bigger was a thing. But yeah, they did. But the downside to that is that belladonna is poisonous. So, you know, you've got to decide whether you have the shame of having small pupils. (laughs) Or certain death. I know what I'd choose. Death. Um, so number two, number two. If, I love this. I actually heard about this at school or something. If you had a tan in the Greek, Roman, Victorian eras, you were deemed low class, like a manual worker, like a field worker. And I just thought to myself, how funny would it be if I was to turn up in like the Victorian era or the Greek era? And like, hi guys! Because of course... <laughs> Of course, black people didn't exist before the wind rush. Um, So that would have been a real feat. If I just turned out, they'd be like, oh my God, she she must be digging the earth's core or something like that. Um, So I thought that was funny. Number three, people used to... (laughs) Why people are crazy? People (laughs) People used to use leeches to keep their skin pale. Which is just... That's just... That's, your, that's on you, that's your... That's <laughs> not on you, I see, brother, brother. Um, but, but that's just hilarious, that's hilarious. I actually had, I went to Borneo when I was 14 and I had a leech attached to my eyebrow. I don't know how it got there, but I remember sort of, I was, in a, I was on a CBBC show, like building a feeding platform for orangutans, whatever. And um, I was like washing a pot. I sound re- I've lived an amazing life. I'm just... <laughs> You know, it just just dawned on me how amazing my life is. But I was watching the pot, and I remember thinking, oh, it's really shadowy on this side of my face. A huge shadow. And then I peeled it off, and blood just down my face. That's for you guys. Exclusive. Okay, and final one, number four. Okay, women in the past (laughs) used to have all sorts of things to cure Freckles, because they believed that freckles was a thing that you needed to cure. And they range from fresh urine, I'm going to let them in terms, fresh piss on the face to crocodile fat. Imagine having to, number one, source a crocodile, get it to be still, somehow extract the fat out of it, just so that you can not have the thing on your face that I spent most of my childhood putting on with magic marker. It's just <laughs> bloody ridiculous. Anyway, so going back to the story of sitting there being a reverse minstrel, I thought, never again. Never again will I allow this to happen. Um, and it hasn't because I learned to sort of speak up for myself and go, please don't paint me another colour. And so it's not happened since. But yeah, that's my relationship with makeup. And I just hope that none of you ever have to go through that. You won't because Boots loves you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can't believe they painted you another Oh my god, they did. They did. It was one of the weirdest things. The whole of what your body? No, no, just the face. Just the face. They didn't do your arms. No, no, no. no. Your skin weren't you matching? Oh, they just, they'd focus on that, darling. Just the face, darling. But no, it was really weird. It has happened a few times with lighting. If there are loads of actors that are all different colours it's not impossible it just means like a couple of extra minutes to work it out because we were in a studio and they just didn't want to do it because we were having to work really really fast and so the easiest thing was to brighten me up and it was I was really upset but then they got a really lovely makeup artist who sort of took over and she sort of came up to me a lovely Indian woman and she went look I've heard the note I know that you're upset. I was like, you have no idea. I'm not being paid enough. And she specialised in fashion makeup. So she was like, I am going to, I swear to God, 
do a lot of trickery that is going to look like you and it's going to be representative and you're not going to look like a reverse minstrel. Trust me, trust me, trust me. And she did do an amazing job. But what I resented was being put in that position in yeah. the first place. Yeah, because being put in a special chair. It's like you say, everyone else is bonding. And yeah, they're having a good time. Uh, and and I was you there going, can't because mm. you're being painted yeah. in a chair. Yeah. It's humiliating and awful. Would you like to meet our guest? <laughs> Um, she is a fantastic comedian, writer, improviser, character comedian. Please put your hands together and make general woohooing noises for Pippa Evans. <laughs> Pippa and I go way back. Way back. Pippa and I were doing a show together, and one day she turned up with no makeup on, and it was not how I knew her. No. I didn't realise, but I'd never seen you without makeup until I saw you without makeup. Yeah. Um, well, but that's how things work. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never seen it yeah, until I'd seen it. The, sure. the rule. What a but story. I, but I don't think, I think you sometimes, if someone always wears makeup, you just don't notice it. Because you, yeah, yeah. you weren't wearing ostentatious makeup. Oh, no, not Jane ostentatious makeup. <laughs> no, no, sorry. <laughs> Very... I didn't mean to reference a rival show. Yeah, yeah rivals. Yeah. <laughs> Keep uh, them away. Pippa's part of Showstopper. Do you know the improvised musical? But yeah. a lot of her friends are in Ostentatious and I've just really name-dropped their Boom. show. We're like the West Side Story of improvisation. Like, they're the Jets and we're the Sharks. And really they are, because every time they see each other, they click their fingers and go into a comedy <laughs> dance. Um, so, any excuse. Do not, do not give Pippa an excuse to go do into a comedy Do not give me an excuse <laughs> to sing. <laughs> Uh, so Pippa, you like the reason you weren't wearing that makeup that day. Can you tell us why? Well, I'll tell, I'll tell you why Deborah France is white. Um, <laughs> it's a smooth segment. <laughs> it really is. Uh, so what happened was I did a project called "A Hundred Days as a Biscuit," uh, which was based on something my mother said to me. Well, darling, you will have to wear mascara, otherwise you will look like a biscuit. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> When your parents, Mothers. isn't it? But when, <laughs> but when parents say things, you don't go. Oh, I wonder what's behind all that. You know, like there's a lot of history. You go, oh, okay, mom. Uh, and so uh, it was something her mum had said to her was she had to wear mascara because otherwise she would look like a biscuit. So to people at home, I'm a very pale, very blonde person. Uh, so without mascara or any kind of highlighting of my features, I do sort of start to sort of look like a biscuit. Uh, although I also look a lot like John Lithgow in a wig. It's like. I, <laughs> I could have called it 100 Days as John Lithgow, <laughs> but I don't think it would have been as interesting. Um, you don't look like John Lithgow. I do you look, look like John I do. Like John. Okay, okay, I go, Sally! Oh, I see it oh you I see sound it like John Lithgow, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I didn't question the biscuit, because clearly you look like a rich tea. I do look like a biscuit. The Lithgow thing. I know we're like too far you yeah, look yeah. like a biscuit but too far yeah so I started thinking about it and there was a lot of advertising a lot of magazines saying in sort of 2013 2014 how to be skin confident and I would read the magazine article it would be full of products to buy and then I saw um, an advert for I think it was Lancome saying uh, how to get the no makeup look and then you had to click through to find out how much and I clicked through and my second thought was this is so ridiculous that there's all these products to look like we're not wearing makeup we buy all these products but my first thought was how much is it uh, <laughs> uh, and it was 150 pounds and I really was tempted to spend 150 pounds to make my face look like my face uh, so, so I, I sort of so I wanted to think about that and why I wore makeup and I realized that, that my relationship with makeup was maybe a bit weird so I decided to challenge myself to not wear makeup for 100 days which I did and what was interesting to me was the amount of responses I got which were either you're so brave uh, which is weird, isn't it? Like, you're so brave to go for 100 days without makeup. And I both agreed and disagreed with that statement because actually it is quite brave because people can be quite horrible when they see your face and they go, Are you all right? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and it's true, because I, I, um, I wore a lot of makeup because I had really bad skin when I was uh, from the age of 19. People always sort of go, oh, I'm, oh, I'm sure it wasn't that bad. But they were, it was horrible spots, like really painful, so it felt like I was being punched the whole time. And then I started trying to convince myself, you know, it's, it's just because of the feeling of them. It doesn't look that bad. And my boyfriend at the time, I woke up one morning, and he was staring oh. over me with this face of, like, horror. And I went, what's happened? And he went, it just looks so painful. And he was talking about my face. Oh. Um, we're not together anymore. Uh, but, but 
I know, but it was, and oh. it really made me so I was like, well, thanks very much. That's the best thing you can say to someone at seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Your face looks painful. So I was very uh, self-conscious about my face. Uh, so that was why I wore a lot of makeup when you first met me. So I did this 100 days and it was, yeah, fascinating to find you wore, out. You didn't wear it on stage? Or... I didn't wear it on stage. I went to my agent's, like, celebrity-driven, a 10 years of Chambers Management, everybody wants to be there party <laughs> with no makeup on. And the most important thing was nothing happened, you know? So nothing, uh, there was only one person actually said to me, I was having my hair cut and this lady said to me, um, she was cut my hair, she was from uh, Bulgaria, I think. She, she said, you know, you would be very beautiful if you wore makeup. And I said, oh, thanks very much. I'm doing this challenge, blah, blah, blah. She went, you're crazy, I would never do that. <laughs> uh, was were, you not ex- were you not tempted to cheat? Oh, well, yeah, of course, yeah. That, like for the big celebrity party, yeah. oh, what I would have done is gone 100 days without makeup, sure, 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 not that day. Yeah. I would have just cheated it and I would have pretended I'd done it and I wouldn't have done it. Well, th- what drove you... Yeah. To that level of insanity. Well, <laughs> I went to a private girls' school, uh, which means that I have to do everything. I'm a, like a classic overachiever. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so this was you were doing this what for Miss Marshall? I was doing it for Mrs. Whitfield. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Very specific. <laughs> Mrs. Whitfield. <laughs> Mrs. Whitfield. She was crap. No, uh, no. Wait, but it's true. I felt like the moment that you feel like you want to give up is the moment you have to push yourself more. And also, you forget that at celebrity parties, those kind of events. Everyone's so self-obsessed anyway. No one cares what you look like because they're all worrying what they look like. And that's true of most of the time, I think. I think they're thinking about me. Well, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Even when you're not there. I think if I don't turn up, they're all, where is she? If I do turn up, they're all, there she is. (laughs) And they're definitely going to see the difference between the liquid eyeliner and the no liquid eyeliner. I just think you've got astounding confidence. And I know it's Mm. ridiculous because I'm looking at you now and I don't see a huge difference between before and after. Really? Oh. No, but that's... Not, that's <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. It's beautiful both ways, do you know what I mean? Like, and I see it in other people, but there's a little piece of me that goes, yeah, I'm a feminist, but... It's Deborah from The Guilty Feminist, briefly interrupting The Guilty Feminist to say our shows in Edinburgh are sold out now. But there are tickets for Sydney, Australia on the 21st of October. If you'd like to get one of those, go to giantdwarf.com.au. Please look out for more tour dates in Australia and New Zealand in October, November this year. If you'd like to support the podcast, we don't ask for donations, but we do have one very special episode about negotiating in which Athena Cableno and I interview expert hostage negotiator Suzanne Williams. It's £5 and the profits are going towards making more live Guilty Feminist events more affordable for more women and helping to make this podcast. Please go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on Negotiation Special. Here's a clip from that special episode available to buy only. And how do people find you? Because I didn't know that this existed just as a job. If somebody needed your services, how would they find out about you and how to ask for your help? If you need me, you can find me. Oh, Oh, I love you so much. She's like a superhero. So could you you train me now? So say Athena was my boss and I was trying to get a pay rise out of her. Could you train me to have a negotiation with Athena? You've got to know what you're worth. Mm. So you have to do your research, just like... I have to do my research about what going rates are. Okay, so Mike is on... £30,000 a year, and I know that, and he's my... I'm making this up, obviously, but this is a scenario I know happens to a lot of women, and I've spoken to women. Mike's on thirty grand a year, I'm on twenty eight, but I've been here longer, and I'm better than Mike. How can you prove that? I can show the deals that I've brought in, that's the deals good. that I've done. Well, that's what you should do. So first advice would be pick your moment. This is not a sort of around the, uh, the water fountain type conversation. Mm-hmm. So pick your moment. Pick your moment that suits you. Okay. Do I make an appointment? Yep. Make okay. an appointment. Thursday, by the way. Thursday's the best day to ask for a pay rise. <gasps> I'm writing that down. This is worth it just for this. <laughs> Thursday. Why Thursday? I don't know. But statistically, Thursday's the best day. Guys, mm. this is on lockdown now. So Thursday, so I make my appointment with Athena for the you Thursday. You make the appointment, you get your evidence, you check around with local recruiters to see if you've got better than the going rates because you may be onto a good thing and you don't know it. Okay. I would probably ask for a little tiny bit more than you really want so there's a little bit of wriggle room for some flexibility. And that would be Isn't an it just way. fair though that if Mike gets it, I should get it? No, life's not fair. <laughs> okay, all right, I'm writing that down. Life's not fair. <laughs> Please.
please welcome to the stage, <laughs> Deborah Francis White. So we're talking about makeup, and uh, probably some of you are thinking, oh, makeup, feminism. She's probably going to say, women, we shouldn't have to paint our faces. Why do we have to paint our faces? That's not necessary. Women, feminism, feminism, hashtag patriarchy makers do it. Sure, sure, sure. And to some extent, yeah, sure, sure. But really what I think is, this is one of the only advantages women have living in the patriarchy. Because men wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and think, well, that's as good as I'm going to look all day. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine just waking up and thinking there's nothing I can do <laughs> within gendered stereotype norms? If I do more than this, I'm going to garner further attention. Because if a man does it, it's sort of, you know, we're blurring gender lines and there's all sorts of conversations that have to happen around it. If a man puts on makeup, it's called, I don't know, guy liner or manscara or chapstick. <laughs> I assume that's what chapstick is. I don't know, but it's, it's always got a special name for men. And men, I think, are very, very limited in this way. And I think it's an odd one, really, because I think there's a quote from Steel Magnolias that you are the core demographic for knowing these kind of films, um, that the thing that separates us from the animals is the ability to accessorise. And I kind of believe that because we decorate. You don't see birds going, oh, what do you think of this coloured feather or that coloured feather for my nest? They're just shoving stuff in. Whereas we're looking at our flat going, oh, what do you think of these cushions? I think I fancy a new blind. I think you don't need a new blind. That old one is blocking the light perfectly well. But you just go, I just need a refresh. We spend so long decorating our flats. When we're kids, we decorate our pencil boxes. It's what makes us human, the need to individualise and decorate. So why would we spend less time on our face the very branding of our soul <laughs> than anything else surely we'd be right in there but boys have very few options look at what blokes generally have without ridicule they have the option of shirts with buttons shirts with no buttons trousers shoes <laughs> if david beckham wears a sarong it's front page news what do you mean? Just like one piece of fabric around the legs instead of two pieces of fabric around the legs. It's odd, isn't it? Oh, it's odd. Oh, 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 he's making a statement. He's making a political statement. He's making a statement because he's put one piece of... Instead of two... He's got no options, is what I'm saying. David Beckham is one of the most famous and celebrated men in the world. He has very few options before he ends up on the front page of a paper. I'm looking at this and I'm questioning it and I'm saying, how has this happened? Because men usually get everything good. How have they missed out on this good thing? I don't understand. They're always first in line. I guess we'll have the good thing. I'm amazed that they're not covered in makeup. And we're not at the back of the queue. It's not for us, guys. It's not for us. Back, up, back away, back away. Go back away. It's all gone. It's all for them. Why have they missed out on this frankly excellent invention? So I've looked, I've looked, and I've done my history. I've done a whole history thing. History of male makeup. In 2010, Bristol University archaeologists discovered evidence that showed Neanderthal men used makeup. Neanderthal! Now, I don't think it was Touche Clan and a sort of tasteful under eye liner. I'll be honest with you, I think it looks, it's poor, it's tasteless what they've chosen. It's not, it's not, I wouldn't wear it. Um, it's more like war paint. It's red and yellow. Like Neanderthal men now today wear at football matches. Um, it's the same thing their people have been wearing for thousands of years. Um, 40,000 years ago, Egyptian men did almond eyes, liquid eyeliner, and red lipstick. Think of a kind of Amy Winehouse sensibility for Egyptian men. That's what they were going for. Length and colour of your nails was a sign of status in society. So Tutankhamun would have had nails like Janice from Friends. And also that applied to Chinese, Japanese people as well. A lot of nail-based status signalling from men, uh, if they were very high up in society, they were very long, very bright coloured nails. Now, the ancient British, like think Beowulf, they daubed their faces all the time, blue woad, and the Romans used to call British guys the Picts, and that meant the painted ones. And proper Beowulf blokes who fought monsters and dragons and stuff, they had a nickname from their Italian buddies, the painted ones. Isn't that amazing? I think if we'd announced that, we wouldn't have Brexited. <laughs> By the middle of the first century AD, the Romans themselves used pig blood as rouge 
They'd caught up, basically. Britain had set a trend. Romans had caught on. And they also painted their heads to disguise <laughs> premature baldness. <laughs> I'm sort of now imagining Roman Chubad saying, do you suffer from male pattern baldness? <laughs> Rub a bit of coal into your head and no one will notice. And then Louis VIII in France, he went bald at the age of 23. So he started saying, wigs are nice, aren't they? And, uh, and in those days, everyone did what the king did. And so, you know all those big white powdered wigs that you see in period features and Blackadder? That's because a 23-year-old king went bald. And so then all of that white makeup started happening. By Elizabethan times, men's grooming was very big. It was key. Men used egg and honey masks to smooth away wrinkles. They favoured powdered skin, a bit like clown makeup. But all they had access to was makeup that contained lead, and that often resulted in premature death. I like makeup a lot, but if my benefit primer was going to knock 20 years off my life, no. Um, I'd be willing to lose the last six months of my life for liquid eyeliner throughout. I mean, the last six months is probably going to be shit anyway, isn't it? And I think, I think a lifetime of liquid eyeliner, a seriously long lifetime of liquid eyeliner, is worth losing a good six to eight months. Six to eight, six to nine... A year, a year or two. I'd, in addition to pale complexions, white hair was also desirable. However, the bleaching agent lie often led to baldness. Irony. Hashtag irony. Now, this was all going on. Men and women all wore makeup. Everyone wore makeup. Everyone was into it. And then Queen Victoria came onto the throne and she said painted faces were vulgar. And in the 1840s, this meant only sex workers and actors wore makeup as they were seen in the same category. Woohoo! So we performers were seen very much in the same category as sex workers and we were allowed to wear makeup, nobody else at that point. So men and women kept using it, but they kept using it very subtly. You know that makeup look that's like a no makeup look? Do you ever buy a woman's magazine? Don't do that. But if you're ever in a waiting room, in a hot, if you're in a doctor's waiting room and you flick through a magazine because you just go, nice to know what the enemy are on to here. And you look through that magazine, look to the magazine and it always says, how to wear loads of makeup and look like you're wearing no makeup. You know that natural look, that's what they started to do. And they would conceal it in special glass bottles. They'd send servants off the rich people and they would have I don't know if you've ever seen an old sort of makeup case with like special beautiful cologne bottles and things that's what they hid them in because it wasn't really seen to be the thing and they'd get very offended if someone said are you wearing makeup and what they started to wear and there was very subtle bit like the tinted moisturiser and then very subtle eyeliner and if anyone said are you wearing makeup they'd just go no they're just my eyes and they'd get very annoyed because it was seen to be basically saying are you an actor um <laughs> That's what happened. Everything was kept underground. Now, towards the end of the Victorian era, I think what happened is, this is my theory, Queen Victoria went up to Balmoral because Albert died and she knows she went into mourning for like 30 years and wouldn't come out. People just went, she's not here. She's not here. She's not here. She's not coming back. She won't come back without notice. She's not here. Shall we just put on, put on a bit of rouge? That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Have you got to put a lipstick? Well, she's not here. She's not here. She's not here. And women took it up again. Basically, this is genuinely what happened. Women took it up again and it slowly started to creep in because basically women just went, oh, fuck it, life's too hard without this. Come on, don't take away one of our very small pleasures to decorate and conceal out anything we want concealed and highlight anything we want highlighted. It's just just a bit of fun, isn't it? It's just a bit of fun. So they started doing it again and men never took it up because at this point it was seen to be not masculine. So the patriarchy have missed a fucking trick, haven't they? They stopped doing something turned around, we took it up and they went, oh, that's just for you. And let's not tell them because a bit of touche clar and a bit of liquid eyeliner before a meeting can give us the edge we so badly need given we're earning 70 pence for a pound. Are we ready to get our second guest on? Um, Please welcome to the stage the lipstick queen, Poppy King. Poppy so, and Pippa, we could be like a little, I don't know, a TV act or something. A uh, puppet show. Poppy puppet and Pippa's puppet, puppet show. That's nice. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so Poppy, yes. we've sort of been talking about makeup and Pippa was saying that she took time off wearing makeup. Yes, I heard that. Um, and Pippa, when you took time off wearing makeup, did you find it liberating? Did you find it stretched your feminism? Well, it just changed me to choosing to wear makeup rather than feeling I had to because if I didn't look a certain way, then people wouldn't listen to me. So now I can use it. As you said, it's a great, it's such a great thing to have to play with. 
um, rather than using it because I'm ashamed of, of my face. I used to worry that people would think I was dirty because my skin was so bad. So it was nice to be like, no, when I have a spot, actually, you know what that means? It means that I'm tired or it means that I haven't been drinking enough water or that maybe I've been drinking a bit too much of the old vino tinto. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, so our face, we forget how much our face communicates information to us and if we're not paying attention to what our skin is saying and um, we're just covering up immediately then and we sort of just shove stuff on the top and pretend so I still love makeup I just use it with the correct intention for me rather than because a magazine told me to yeah Mm. and I would like to get to that place now Poppy yes you have a very famous brand called Lipstick Queen and it's a brand I actually love and can I just be clear this isn't an infomercial Um, (laughs) Poppy is neither being paid nor paying to be here but if you do put Guilty Feminist into (laughs) poppykingmakeup.com you will get 15% of it no I was just about to say but if you wanted to name a lipstick after me that would be okay now (laughs) Guilty Feminist would be a great shade (laughs) I see a collaboration coming up don't promise that if that's not going to happen, don't, don't go I'm just trying to think what colour that would be. I'll come to it by the end of the show. Don't go promising that if that is a lie. Now, Poppy, what I want to ask you is your makeup brand is a feminist... It's, it's lipsticks and rouge, isn't it? Well, it's, it's there's one rouge, so... It's, it's, basically, it's, it's lipsticks basically lipsticks with one rouge. But it's like a feminist makeup brand. How so? I've been designing lipsticks for 26 years now, so as I like to say, for over a quarter of a century, which makes it sound really, really terrifying and really bizarre, considering when I started I thought it was just going to be something I did until I kind of figured out a real job, and it turns out that this was it. But I'm really fascinated with lipstick. I'm not interested in makeup at all, and actually I'm sitting with two wonderful women who work on PR with me, and I just was remembering a question I got asked a few weeks ago where somebody asked me, you know, what would you like to see more of in the beauty industry? Industry. And I that said, that is a better question. <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> and I said, less of the beauty industry. And so basically, I got into lipstick to me is not really a cosmetic, it's more like a superhero cape. So when I first tried on lipstick when I was about seven, and this is a little bit of a sad story, this is where you play the sad music, my father was dying, and he was dying very young. And so the world was not such a fun place at seven for me. And I snuck off with my mother's lipstick, sort of thinking, oh, well, this will, you know, be a bit of a distraction, and put it on, sort of knowing that it was going to look different. I was going to look different on the outside. But what really struck me and sort of mesmerised me was actually how I felt on the inside. Like, what it looked like on the outside was not really as important or as kind of magical to me. It's kind of the, the effect that it had on me on the inside then cut to sort of 17 and, you know, I'm sort of not a conventional-looking teenager and I couldn't find any lipsticks. I sort of had figured out that I looked better when I emulated sort of other eras than when I tried to emulate the beauty standards of the current day. And so I was looking for sort of old-fashioned 1940s-style lipsticks. And when I was walking around department stores in Australia, where I'm from originally, but I live in New York now, I couldn't find anything that kind of looked at all sort of like what the body would produce, you know, and I very much believe that the lipstick colours that suit you have to be somewhat related to something that the body can naturally produce in colour. I mean, yes, I do have a blue lipstick, but it kind of looks like your lips are bruised in a good way. (laughs) Sheer blue lipstick. And I just felt like I had two choices, a little bit like either make myself fit in, you know, straighten my hair, get my nose done, put fake tan on, do all the things that kind of like you see as the beauty ideal and then I could fit in and participate in beauty or I had the choice of kind of like hang on a minute stuff that I'm going to sort of look to another era where my features and my sensibility may not have been so outcast and found that I couldn't find the lipsticks I could find makeup that could do sort of like 1940s but I couldn't find anything that was like a 1940s lipstick and so that's how I got into making lipsticks was because basically I felt really disenfranchised from what the beauty ideal was of the day and I still do to this day and so my brand is always about not showing any standardised idea of beauty so I don't ever show models or celebrities or anything like that it's all graphic art it's all narrative it's all conceptual you know it's whimsical and it's fun and it's very glamorous but I never hold up an ideal of beauty but you know fun enough I have got quite a few lipstick cream lipsticks and I've never realized that until you said it tonight 
that you never ever see a model lipstick queen? No, and it's actually something that I've literally because I sold my company five years ago, but I still do all the products and I still do, you know, I'm still sort of Willy Wonka. <laughs> it's the best way to describe it, Chief Willy Wonka officer. And it's actually something that I've had to really fight with the board. Like I've literally had to stand in front of the board, like sort of. Kevin Bacon in Footloose, you know. Uh, that's what came to me and probably no one in the audience is old enough to know no, Footloose. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, in terms of... like dying to sing it. <laughs> in terms of, like, getting them to back a strategy that doesn't involve using models and the only way in which I would use any kind of idea of beauty in a human form versus an art form is if it was somebody that really has a genuine connection to the brand. Like about a week ago in New York, I went into a store to pick up some moisturiser and a woman was in the store buying my lipstick. And she was just so fantastic in every way and knew everything about the lipsticks and like could really articulate why she loved them and everything. And so I got her number because I said, you know, like maybe, you know, they're always at me about using faces, you know, maybe we could use her. So again, it comes back to the whole idea of narrative, if they have a narrative versus just a face. What do you guys think about like the Dove campaign for real beauty? Because I think... You know when they use sort of virtual commas real people? Mm. Because I'm never sure about it. Because once when I was picking out new headshots, I said to my husband, what do you think of this one? Do you think that looks a bit Dove campaign for real beauty? And he went, no, darling, you look lovely. And I thought, well, that campaign's failed. <laughs> because he knew exactly what I meant. <laughs> and that's what it is. It's like, I don't look like the models, but still look how happy I am not looking like the models. And when you see them on the tube... You look at them and you go, oh, why is that not a model? Oh, it's that. And because mm. it's the only one, I don't know that it really... I'm not saying it's better not to have it. No, 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 mm. I, I'm literally considering the question. I don't know, I find it, something about forcing. Yes, we love all the shapes. The minute you tell someone that you love mm-hmm. all the shapes, you just don't believe them, do you? Mm. Because you, you feel like, oh, that's my special campaign for my... Because I'm normal and I'm, I'm average, you know. Mm. Uh, you know, all ad- advertising campaigns that advertise they say you're special and you're different, whereas Dove says you're all the bloody same. Just buy the cheap stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And I think, yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit with you and sort of I'm thrilled to hear that you've never really noticed that about the brand, with my brand, because I think once you start saying it, it, mm. it sort of ends up being looks, commodified. That's the, that's the marketing campaign. Yeah. yeah. Like, I didn't know yours was a feminist brand until actually somebody contacted me and said that. And I thought, <laughs> is it? Is it? I was so intrigued and I just thought, well, this show tonight could all be us sitting there. Yeah, we, should, we shouldn't mm. need it. We shouldn't need it. And I just thought, what is the other argument? Do you think it's giving women the option of extra confidence? I think it's giving the women a sense of possibility, you know, in terms of, like, when you put on lipstick, the main thing that I hear all the time is like, oh, you know, I was feeling shit and then I put on lipstick and I felt like I was able to. I think it's more about that sense of possibilities for me in terms of, and lipstick is a really fast way to sort of completely transform, like other cosmetics correct or conceal or enhance, but lipstick really transforms sort of what you feel is possible for you in any given day. I would say that's true for some women. Mm. I would say there are some women who would feel very strongly that lipstick changes nothing for them. I absolutely know what you mean, and I think that can be very true Mm. for me. I'm just also aware that we sometimes talk about women as a monolithic group. um, Well, that's why, in my line, I play a lot with pigment levels. So I have lipsticks, like the one that you mentioned to me earlier, Medieval, which is a very, very sheer red, so that you can participate in sort of the joy of sort of like decorating but without the sort of having to look painted you know so I have a lot of lipsticks actually within the line mm. that really are specifically for kind women of who don't like lipstick. yeah for women who don't or who don't want to feel like they've painted something and the funny thing is it's like you know throughout my sort of 26 years of doing this is really on the whole most men hate lipstick <laughs> most well, men they hate it for themselves they hate it on women <laughs> well I've just designed a unisex lipstick that's coming out in uh, so October so we'll see about that but know that most men in terms of the idea that you're putting lipstick on to please men 
I think uh, most of the men I've ever met really don't, especially red lipstick, don't really like it. I think it's like a barrier to entry, so to speak. <laughs> really? I had no idea that was a trend in any wow. way. No, I think that was true. My husband hates lipstick because he, he just even like the thought of there being something sticky on your lips or something. But so that for me, that would be I would be putting it on for me rather than yeah. for someone else. And I think that's a common myth. I did meet a guy on the train when I was doing my 100 Days of the Biscuit thing and I was like telling him about it and he said, well, it's right because you're already married so you don't need to look nice anyway what? yeah 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 uh, I don't know, so it's not really about that actually and then we carried on talking and then he was getting off the stop and he picked his stuff and he said just so you know i would <laughs> that's Good all right know. then Thanks. that's all right Thanks. then man on the train oh, oh. Yeah. So. yeah well i've actually uh, had a boyfriend once that couldn't really understand like once we were together why i still was wearing the red lipsticks like well you know we're together now like you don't need to wear <laughs> the that. job's been done <laughs> I've won you. I got rid of him. I mean, no, notice I'm still wearing red lipstick. Yeah, he's still wearing the lipstick. Yeah. Audience, do you have any questions? Yes, there's a hand at the back. I work in the theatre, so I really appreciate the whimsy and the expression of makeup. But personally, I've stopped wearing it because of consumerism, waste, and chemicals. So I find I'm very worried about putting all the alcohols and the chemicals on my skin and on my lips. So I was wondering what everyone up there feels about that. I've got very sensitive skin, so I have to be careful what I put onto it. I have actually come up in all sorts of reactions to makeup. There's a lot of things that I just can't use. So I have to be careful. Is it more to do with the reaction to your skin or just eth ethically? What are we putting into the world? Yeah, probably not great, but I don't know. After the 100 days, uh, <laughs> and my skin was so much better, and I swear it's because of a lot of, per se, from a personal point of view, I'm not someone who is able to buy £150 expensive makeup. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot of my makeup is cheaper, and it did start me actually looking into that. Stuff, and there's so much crap in a lot of makeup. I mean, if you want to go ethically, uh, in terms of packaging, mm -hmm. plastics, you, you could, I don't know if you could, could yeah, you? Yeah, the world is probably better off without makeup in terms of oh, damn this show is wrong <laughs> you bring it let's just scrub the podcast but, um, but so much of that you know uh, ethically for me is such a big question it's so hard I was doing the other day about why am I not a vegan and I was saying because I really like cheese and that's basically the problem of all ethical questions is mm. I'd give up I cheese like before it. a liquid eyeliner they if I have to, yeah. like, I can't give up everything, but I'll definitely give up cheese first and eyeliner second. Well, that question is what, because I used to come to, not blows, I used to come to blows, who do I think I am? I used to come to little, little arguments. Um, with, there was this girl who'd always go on about ethical clothing, which I absolutely am for, and I'm much more conscious of it. She used to really have a go at me, and I thought about it, and I thought, well, my family growing up were incredibly poor. My mum would give me a shirt and I'd wear it. I'd be like, no, mother, that's, you know, I'm not going to wear that. I didn't bloody know, number one. And I just feel like a lot of the more organic, better, healthier options of everything, mm. food, clothes, makeup, are all too expensive. So, But it's also highly possible the woman that said that to you was buying lots and lots of ethical clothes, in inverted commas, but you, as a child, had worn one thing for, you know... Oh, yeah, for, for, for yes. ...that was handed down through the family. So it might have been not bought at a sort of craft artisan cheesecloth shirt shop. But we made it last week. <laughs> five generations of homeless wore it, so, you know, split the difference. Question over there? It was, um, it was more an observation, actually. Um, oh, good. Oh, my, <laughs> my, what um, have you observed? Hello. Oh, um, God. My mother studied women's studies and psychology, like, about over 20 years ago, though, and she said um, one of the reasons um, some women and some men do like red lipstick on women is because it reminds them of vaginas. Yeah. Um, that slight tint on the lips, apparently, and I just wondered if mm. anyone else had heard that. Yes, and, um, I heard it in the Tim Minchin song. <laughs> Not really? <laughs> yeah, like, the lips of a happy vagina. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I, actually, I actually once had somebody convinced a guy that was how women chose lipstick. That there was like, a, so it's like, was there, is there a room? Like, do you go into a room? Like, yeah, there's a room behind the counter, and you kind of like, because that's how we know what suits us, is we look down there, <laughs> yeah. See, I, a bit yeah. of me is thinking that's a good idea. <laughs> oh my god! Do you know? I've got to say, I I heard that. I think that didn't sound when you said it. It didn't sound unfamiliar to me. And I remember my reaction going, "It's not red." <laughs> like, is it mine down there? It's not. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point. Oh, coming on. Which bit of the vagina does it look like? 
<laughs> yes. There's a bit of bears. It's quite right. complicated. We didn't get into the, yeah. quite into that. And that was all right. Sorry, sorry Bobby. Unless you go... No, sorry. No, I'm not going <laughs> to... No. <laughs> Don't, no. 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 I mean, yeah. I'll see you in the bar what afterwards. We'll have a chat about yeah, it. What I was like... going to say to you, I'll now say in the dressing room. <laughs> 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 Uh, Poppy King, have you got anything you'd like to plug? I guess I should plug the brand, Lipstick Queen, but no, just kind of do what you want. <laughs> Start businesses, wear lipstick, whatever, just, you know, believe in the possible. I don't know, that's what I want to plug. <laughs> But I do want to play I'm a feminist but. Yes. <gasps> oh. Because <laughs> I was thought of two really well. Okay, but I've sort of given one away a little bit. So I'm a feminist but my heart still beats really fast when you see Jake Ryan in 16 Candles. <laughs> when the, when my, in the scene, again, I'm showing my age, when the car drives away and you see Jake Ryan outside the church to pick up Molly Ringwald. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, oh no, the other one's. I think now that I'm up here, I think the other one's a bit too scary to say. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we'll edit it out. I want to We'll edit it out. No one will know. Please. All right. <laughs> I am a feminist, but I have always had to protect men's egos in order to stay in business. Wow. That, ooh. <laughs> no, good. That's really You just sold a whole heap of lipstick to me, baby. Pippa, <laughs> um, do you have anything to plug? Well, uh, I'd love it if everyone came to see my Edinburgh Fringe Festival show, which is called Joy Provision. Uh, <laughs> and it's Sorry. about how the world's going crazy, so are we even allowed to laugh anymore at the uh, Pleasants? Please come. It will be nice to see you there. Lovely. And we can follow you at Pepper Evans? Uh, follow me on Twitter at I am Pepper Evans. I am Pepper Evans. Uh, Susie, what go on? Well, um, Chewing Gum, which is an E4 show that I'm in. Oh, yeah, guys. That's on E4, as well as Crazy Head, which is the other one. And there's some other things, but I can't say them yet. I am Deborah Francis White, and I would like to plug Global Pillage at globalpillage.net. Follow The Guilty Feminist on Twitter at guiltfempod. Check out our Instagram, instagram.com forward slash The Guilty Feminist. Like our Facebook page, sign up to our mailing list to get notified as soon as a new episode is released. And please go to iTunes and rate, review and subscribe. It helps other people find the podcast. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest host Susan Wacoma, and our very special guests, Pippa Evans and Poppy King. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. Music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Salinsky for The Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Zoe Metis, Sally, and everyone at King's Place, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. <laughs> I often used to get uh, people saying I look like Tony Collette. I once had a woman at a party. She backed me into a corner. She was so drunk. And she was going, I know you. I know you from that movie, Muriel's Wedding. And I was like, no, no, that wasn't me. And people do say I look like her. No, no, it was you. It was you. <laughs> you were in it. And I said, I think I, I'd remember it. I think it would be probably quite, really, quite life-changing, that one. I think I'd definitely remember. No, you're Muriel from Muriel's Wedding. In um, the end, I just had to say I was. <laughs> Sometimes it is, yeah. That, that happens with me with John Lithgow quite a lot. <laughs> 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 <laughs>